Hello, all yous worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today's question is actually a comment that went on to video number 1241 on sourcing out grounding. The questioner's name is Matt. Unfortunately, in comments, they don't really give you a place for putting your call sign. Please do if you comment and you have a call sign, please put it in there. It, it's kind of normal on ham radio. Call sign is sort of like part of a person's identity. And with just the name Matt, if I go online to like QRZ and search on Matt, I will venture to guess that there's several thousand hams by the name of Matt. So I won't be able to get it down to the actual call. He says, uh, this was my question, but the part I was asking about wasn't addressed. I'm most concerned about the single point ground panel with lightning suppression being outside the house while the non-weatherproofable protected AC power in the diagram you showed, ground point is inside the house. Now, I'm kind of working on that because I'm a little confused myself. I know that the various ground rods that you have, and that includes one maybe at the base of your tower or at the base of your vertical antenna or something like that, should be connected via number six copper wire. It should be bonded. The term bonding means simply connected to each other. The number six is what is usually in uh, all of the literature on that. This right here, this book, Grounding and Bonding for the Radio Amateur by Ward Silver, second edition. Okay, second edition has got all kinds of answers on what to do. Now, here's the thing I'm just learning about, and I need to approach my grounding expert on this. We want the grounds bonded to each other. The idea, see, my ground rod is just right outside the wall right there. And then the utility ground is just around the corner at the front of the house. They are bonded. But if there is a direct lightning strike, you can keep your station protected, but the household ground might have a different potential from your ham radio ground just because of the sheer volume of current. Remember, large volumes of current through what to lightning is a relatively thin wire in number six can cause a voltage drop. E equals IR, the amount of current and the resistance of the wire, which is very low, the current is high, can create a fairly significant voltage difference. So I'm trying to learn exactly how I need to connect the ground in this area, the electrical ground in this area, with my single point uh, ground panel, so that all the electrical equipment that's plugged into the wall, like a power supply or something like that, uh, stays at about the same voltage as all of your equipment. And that is the purpose of bonding that household green wire ground to the single point ground panel. Now, there are two places in the station where I ground, and I'll show you the one in the station underneath all the cables and stuff that I have in here. This right here is my 110 volt thing to all the different things that take that. There's a switch right here. I can turn it all off like that okay or turn it all back on now under here you see a piece of copper pipe okay and what i have done is i hammered the end of it about that much on the end i hammered that down to flat so i bent it in and then bent it out so that i can connect that here with a bolt to the, the wood here, and then all my grounds from everything come to here. The nice thing about that is that this is connected to the ground panel, which is right outside where that is. That's where my actual single point ground panel is. But this right here pulls all the grounds from all the equipment together. I use just strap to do that braid strap because there's no issue with water in here. So let's just go outside and take a look at that panel. This right here is my single point ground panel. Okay, now it is got my lightning arresters here on this big copper plate. And copper plate is my single point ground panel. This is a Cat5 cable that somehow got run through here. These are, there's 10 of them in here. They're stacked too deep. This is for the GMRS repeater, and it goes up to an antenna on the roof. Now, note that this panel here 
and an electrician did this for me. In fact, I had an electrician install this. There was a drilling through the wall and stuff like that. This right here that's marked in green tape is this right here, which comes down to a ground rod right here. Okay, and then here is my bonding, which comes right into this and through that bottom one. It's hard to see the ground because it's been covered with the grass a little bit. Now, there's another ground rod right here. This was my old ground rod. It still has the lightning arresters attached. We need to get them off of there. Okay, and you see the bonding wire here go to that and then around to the other ground. It's connected to this ground rod. This is my mast for the uh, 70 centimeter antenna and then up there is the GMRS antenna and it's grounded right here too. And every cable I have to any antenna comes through here, through one of these lightning arresters. So that way it doesn't go into the house. Now, is there extra voltage that goes into the house? Yes. When these things, when lightning comes through these things, what happens is a path to ground is provided for the lightning. It basically shorts the cable, okay? So you can get 10 to 20 volts here on this side, whereas on this side, it could be like a thousand volts. And it happens for a very short period of time, just the duration of the lightning strike. Or if there is a nearby lightning strike and your antenna picks up a significant voltage and comes through here, I have lots of room for expansion. And I also need to put a device right up here. I like to keep instruction books right next to the things they instruct about. Right here, I'm going to put this for, these are the antenna rotor control cables. So that will be connected up here. So there's a lot that goes on. This came from KF7P Metalworks, which is in Salt Lake City, okay? And they also sell the Morgan arresters. These are Morgan arresters right here. Now, future projects include extending the bonding all the way over there to my vertical antenna. That vertical antenna uh, just send a ground wire straight out because there is a ground rod out there and bonding that to that. Okay, it tries to keep things at the same or similar voltages, which reduces the amount of damage that's caused. This right here is the ground rod for the house. This is the utility ground. And you can see right here that this is the end of that bonding rod, okay? I need to shorten that a little bit. And this is for the house, right? Okay, so the actual ground comes behind this double panel. This is the only place it connects to the neutral. And at only one place is the neutral connected to the green wire ground that's in here. And then that's connected to the ground rod right here. Okay, and then this is underground cabling coming from out by the street. Giving you a little bit of a tour of what I do for grounding and a bit of a glimpse of the future of, of that. I do have more work to do. There's always more work to do, right? I've never met a ham who is satisfied with his antennas. Everybody seems to, you know, put up an antenna. And if you went crazy according to code, you'd have very different antennas from what we have today. The problem is most hams consider their antennas to be, I'm going to try this for a while. So you know you're going to take it down at some point and put a new one up. A little bit more permanent is a tower. Of course, that's quite costly. It's kind of outside the scope of our videos about putting up towers. Although I have talked about it a little bit and can talk some more about it if we need to. The thing is with towers, you've got to have your concrete base, you've got to have it poured. It'll take a lot. If you do it with a cement mixer, you'll be there a long time. Uh, off time, the tower vendors provide the things you need to sink into the concrete. Then there's the little matter of getting the tower up and vertical. Uh, the classic old way of putting up the first section, climbing up it, putting up the second section, climbing up it, putting on the third section. If you're going to spend that much, hire a lift so that you can put those sections on easily. 
Don't even think of trying to do this by yourself. It can take five to six people to put up a tower. So you'll need to have a tower raising party. The essential ingredients are all the parts of the tower, all the parts of the antenna, a nice barbecue and lots of brats. Okay, then you can, uh, can do that. So it's uh, summertime right now, good time for antennas and so on. Note that in general, your tower will require a permit, okay? Because it's considered a permanent structure. So talk to your local code officials and see what you need. Some years ago, the uh, county of Uray was working with its planning commission to include something about ham radio towers. And I went down and offered my thoughts to the committee testified to the committee and recommended a 50-foot limit, but they ultimately settled on a 35-foot limit, which is about the right height for 20 meters. Towers require fairly extensive grounding because just the tower itself, because boy, oh boy, they are, you know, it's like the tower lifting its arms to the heavens and saying, strike me, and it will. So you just need to be prepared for that. And as I point out, we do all this lightning protection, okay, but in the event of a direct strike, all bets are off. I once suffered a direct lightning strike on my ham radio station. That was interesting. Totally vaporized the antenna. Couldn't find any piece of that copper wire and blew apart the coax cable and things like that. So direct strike is, is nothing to be too careful about. If you are in a lightning prone area, which generally means the Gulf Coast or Florida or something like that, and you get lots of lightning, I would recommend in addition to all the standard stuff you do, take your radio when you're not using it and completely disconnect it from everything. Disconnect it from power, the ground, the antenna, just set it on the other side of the room, okay? And you'll be in good shape. By the way, if you are wondering about, well, what about EMP? They do make lightning arresters for hams uh, who are concerned about that, that the problem with regular lightning arresters for EMP is EMP happens too fast. But these have got the right components in them so they can act like a lightning arrester for that EMP and they've got less than a nanosecond rise time. So they're, they're really good. I did a video about that once. So there you have it, Matt. I hope that helps uh, get an idea. The, the basic idea is to keep all the voltages in your house close to each other, pretty close, doggone close to each other. And that way you really limit the damage to your radios and other household things that might get damaged by that. I did not have a ground system for my radio at the time. And it was dumb. I'm still dumb, but I'm older. I've got more experience. So until we next meet, 73.